start recording and then go. Sadly, can't stay for story time. Ah, uh, oh, oh well. Thank you, Aziza, for showing up. Have a nice time wherever you are in that hotel room. And uh, yes, gonna be right back, make hot cocoa. This is the perfect time to make hot cocoa and to sit around, cover yourself up. You should put your blankies on. It's story time, like here. Put your little blanket on your lap. Oh, your son is getting grumpy. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> yeah, let him, let him listen to the story. Yes, any rate, this is by the book. Um, and uh, this is chapter seven, Unexpected Meetings. That little imp, that little angel, that little nuisance. Hawk didn't know whether to hug her or turn her over his knee. All right, he said when he found his voice. He snatched the book from Wren and thrusted it out. Here's your book. Now go home like you promised and take Wren with you. Hey, said Wren, hands planted on her hips. Aren't you even going to thank me? Thank you, said Hawk in disbelief. For what? For hiding the book so we almost didn't find it? Wren's eyes went wide with indignation. I was just trying to get it back, she said. In case you didn't notice, I didn't need your help, said Hawk scornfully. What if they caught you? This isn't a game, Wren. You could have been killed. Wren wilted at Hawk's tone. Sorry, she said quietly, her face downcast. Hawk's anger deflated instantly at Wren's crushed expression. He put a hand on her shoulder. But I am glad to see you, he said more gently, and to know you're okay. Then he turned to Al. You and Wren need to go back home, he said sternly. This is really no place for children. Children? Al interrupted coldly. You're barely older than I am. Furthermore, I only promised I'd return to Wren, and I have. He indicated their sister with a sardonic little bow. Al, said Falcon gently before Hawk could strangle his younger brother, you know that you and Wren can't stay here. Al frowned, his pale brows drawn down in irritation. Neither of you is making any sense, he said slowly. I've gone to all this trouble to get here, and I'm minutes from the town. To turn around and go back on a two-day journey would be ridiculous. Hawk glanced at the lengthening shadows. It was getting a little too late for them to start traveling at that. He thought it for a moment. It really didn't matter, Hawk supposed, if the kids spent one night in town before returning home. For that matter, why should they go back to Alpendorf at all? The whole point was to get them to Alp get them out of Alpendorf, and here they were here. So, what did you come here for? Hawk asked Owl, curiosity winning over annoyance. Owl wasn't exactly the adventurous type. So there must be something very important in Sigborg if he had enticed him to leave his books and travel all the way here. I need to find someone who can answer a question for me, Al replied with an odd look at Wren. As soon as I get the answer, I intend to go home, and I'll take Wren back with me. Al, Falcon said tensely, you've got to go now. This place is dangerous. Whatever information you need, why don't you let us find it for you and tell you later? You can both be safe at home tomorrow if you start now. Hawk shrugged. Actually, I don't see why they should go back at all. Falcon looked at him in shock. What? Alpatorf is our home. The reason I left, insisted Hawk, was to find a way to get you all out of there. I was going to get a job as an adventurer so you could all come live here. You're going to get a job as an adventurer? Wren cried in delight. Hawk, said Falcon tensely, you've seen how dangerous this place is. You heard what the sheriff, 
Give it a rest, Falcon, snapped Hawk. Yes, I've heard, and I'm not afraid. And if you are, that's your problem. You have no right to put Owl and Wren in danger, countered Falcon hotly. Owl snorted. They seem to be doing fine on their own. I have a suggestion, said Owl quietly. It's going to be dark soon. All four of us should stay, go back to town now. It would be safer if we stayed together, wouldn't it? Reluctantly, Falcon nodded. We'll sleep in town tonight, continued Owl. Then, Falcon, you can watch Wren in the morning. I'll find my answer, come back to fetch Wren before noon, and we'll be on our way. Hawk hesitated. He didn't want Owl and Wren to go back, but he could see that Owl's argument was swaying Falcon. Maybe he should just let it rest for now and take it up with him again in the morning. It'll be all right, Hawk said, putting his hand on Falcon's shoulder. They can't get into any trouble with us around to protect them. Hawk could see that Falcon still wasn't completely convinced. But to his relief, there was no further argument. Together, the four of them headed down the slope towards the gate of Sighor. Wren had never seen such a place as fascinating as the hero's tail in, or two people as fascinating as the innkeeper and his wife. Shamin let Wren explore the place from attic to basement while her brothers squabbled about how much they should have to pay to stay the night. According to Shamin, they had the entire inn to themselves except for a friend of the innkeeper's who hardly ever came out of his room. To Wren's amazement, Shamin let her have a room of her own with a real bed. The meal Shima fixed was nothing more than a turnip stew and bread, but somehow she managed to make it taste good. Falcon wasn't hungry, so Wren end, ended up with more food than she'd ever eaten at home. Right after supper, though, Hawk ordered her to go to bed as though she were a child. When she refused to go, he actually slung her over his shoulder and carried her up the stairs, which was kind of fun. Wren, of course, had no plans to sleep. If her brothers were going to make her leave in the morning, she'd have to find something exciting to do at the night. As soon as she heard the boys go to their rooms, Wren opened her door and slipped out as quietly as possible. Peeking down the stairs, she could see that Shamin was seated by the fireplace, wide awake. Somehow, she didn't think it would be a good idea to march right past him and out the door in the dead of the night. It was a good thing, then, that she'd picked a room overlooking the alley. Smiling to herself, Wren went back into her room and quietly eased the window open. It wasn't that hard to climb down the walls. All the timber work on the outside made for some nice handholds. There wasn't anything interesting in the alley, so as soon as she reached ground level, Wren tiptoed across the shadowed cobblestones and out into the town's center. It was deserted now. No merchants, no townspeople, no market stands. There was only the huge well in the middle, the crumbling ruins of a burned building, and the dark and empty looking shops that circled the town center. The signs all had symbols on them. Wren spotted a tailor, a grocer, and a toy maker, but she didn't recognize the rest. She tried to look into the toy maker's shop through the shutters, but all she could see were cobwebs. The shop had obviously been closed for some time. Unfortunately, there didn't seem to be too much to do in the town center besides peek into the shops. She absently jostled the pouch at her side, wondering if she could throw a rock into the well from this distance. It would be good fun to try, but she was getting a little low on good throwing rocks and she didn't want to waste one. There were three streets leaning away from the center of town. Just for fun, she chose the one across from the inn and started walking. All she could see, though, were more closed and empty shops. Just when she was ready to turn back, 
Ren came to a side road leading south. It looked dark and secretive somehow. She smiled, wondering if she dared check it out. Well, 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 said a voice directly behind her, soft but rough, like a cat's tongue. Ren turned sharply and saw a man in a long black cloak standing half hidden in the shadows. Not sure of what to say, she took a moment to stare at him. Most of the people around here were pale and stocky, but this man was lean, with olive skin and a nose like an eagle. His long, thick hair tied back from his face was even darker than his cloak, a foreigner. He had a neatly trimmed goatee and black leather gloves. Just what exactly are you up to, little boy? said the man in a suspicious tone. Little boy. I, I was just looking around, Wren said, staring at his gloves. They looked really expensive. This is my first time in Siegburg. You do have that touristy look about you, said the stranger, stepping out from the shadows and eyeing her up and down. Wren blinked. In the shadows, he'd looked like a foreign prince. In the light, she could see he, that he needed a shave and had a thin scar along his jawline. Nice clothes or not, this guy was no nobleman. The stranger tugged absently at the cuff of one of his gloves. Not smart to be wandering around town by night by yourself, you know. There's bad guys out. Thieves. Nasty people like that. I've already met some thieves, said Wren, still studying him cautiously. They weren't so scary. The man's face registered Miles' surprise. Then he smiled. The expression changed his face completely, and Wren's wariness blew away like smoke. If those had been real thieves, the man said, you wouldn't still have that gold thing on your neck. What is that, a key? He stepped forward to peer at it. Yeah, but there's no lock to go with it, said Wren. It's pretty useless. Let me take a look at it. Wren tensed. Why? I'm curious, that's all, he said, like a cat. The man leaned in closer. He made a little purring noise. Wren laughed. He smelled nice, a little like cloves. Carefully, he inspected the key, turning it over in his slim leather glove fingers, and making the chain tighten around her neck. Wren knew it wouldn't, he couldn't slip it off without undoing the clasp. The chain wasn't long enough. It looks pretty pricey, he said. Wren shrugged and grinned. Are you a thief, she guessed. The man opened his eyes wide. They were dark, even darker than owls. Me, he said. What an awful thing to say. Wren thought she saw one corner of his mouth twitch with a suppressed smile. She tried to look down into his hand, but he caught her under the chin and looked directly into her eyes. So what's your name, little boy? She, he still thought she was a boy. How funny. She started to tell him her name, then hesitated. She should tell him a boy's name. What should she be called if she were a boy? Fox, she said on impulse. His eye gave a little flicker of what? Surprise? Suspicion? Amusement? She wasn't as good at reading people as Falcon was. I'm Bruno, he said, for what it's worth. But I think it's a little late for a young boy to be out by himself. Who are you here with? Oh, don't worry about me, she said. I'm used to going places at night by myself. I can do a lot more when everyone's asleep. At this, Bruno laughed, and Wren grinned back without even meaning to. I hear you, Fox, Bruno observed. Not a bad name, actually. I know a guy who's got a thing about foxes. I like them, too, said Wren. Maybe you could introduce us. Bruno snorted then gave her, tea, her key one last playful yank. I better get back to work, kid, he said, releasing her, which means you better find 
someplace else to sniff around. You work at night, Wren said, puzzled. That's weird. What do you do? You're full of questions, said Bruno. Unfortunately, I'm fresh out of answers. If you look right over there, though, you can see my office. He pointed directly behind her. Wren turned to look. There was nothing there but a tailor shop, which was obviously closed. You're not a tailor, are you? She turned back to look at him. He was gone. On sudden impulse, Wren patted herself down and noticed that her pouch full of rocks was missing. Wow, she said in the darkness, an ear-to-ear -ear grin splitting her face. He really was a thief. Hawk was the first one up the next morning, and he waited impatiently at the head of the table for the others to get moving. He should have known that nothing involving his family would ever go smoothly. Shima served him a large bowl of sweet pudding that he wolfed down before Falcon even made it down the stairs. While Shima served Falcon, Al wandered down and seated himself at Falcon's other side. Al, always a slow eater, finally managed to finish off his breakfast, but there was still no sign of Wren. Hawk had to go upstairs and pound on her door. Finally, she came out, yawning and rubbing her eyes. Hawk set her down next to him and then quickly laid out his plans for the day. He finally had enough to pay the shearmeister, and, and Falcon was going to do the work at the stables before returning to do chores at the inn. It made the most sense for Wren to go with Falcon. Hawk thought that she'd be excited to see a real live castle, but once again, he'd underestimated his family's ability to be difficult. I'm staying here in town, she sobbed, stirring listlessly at her porridge. I don't want to go to some boring old castle. It's not boring, said Hawk, astonished. It's where the Baron von Sagborg lives. Now stop playing with your porridge and eat. Parents are boring, Wren said, laying down her spoon and folding her arms. I want to see the town. There's a slight problem with that plan, said Owl. Yeah, agreed Hawk. I forbid it. Believe it or not, said Owl with a quirk of his eyebrow. There's a more serious problem with that. What are you talking about? This is Sigborg, not Alpendorf, said Al severely. This is a civilized town and happens to be part of a civilized duchy. Young maidens of Ullman do not go wandering around unchaperoned. I'm not a maiden, said Wren indignantly. I'm not even bullish. Hawk looked at her. He wasn't sure volish was a word, but in any case, she was probably right. They were all too tall and fine-boned to be of lo local stock. Who could tell where they came from? It doesn't matter, said Owl. When in Silmaria, you'd best speak Silmarian. I'm not Silmarian either, Wren protested, and Hawk gave her a firm whack on the side of her head. It's an expression, dummy, Hawk explained. Girls aren't supposed to wander around the streets alone here. So I won't be a girl, Wren declared with a grin. Hawk just gapped at her. Huh? I look like a boy. I cut my hair like a boy. I dress like a boy. So let everybody think I'm a boy. We can pretend that I'm your brother Fox. That way I can go where I want to. I don't want you wandering around town, replied Hawk in ex exasperation. I'm about ready to sling you over my shoulder and carry you off to the castle. I'll scream, said Wren. She took in a deep breath. Al and Falcon almost leaped across the table to cover her mouth. Hawk got there first. Al sat back in his chair as Hawk restrained their squirming sister. I don't think screaming will be necessary, he said thoughtfully. Wren doesn't have to go to the castle. She can do the dishes and the laundry at the inn while Falcon cleans the stables. Wren made a muffled sound of protest from under Hawk's hand. 
Then Falcon can see us off at noon. It'll be safer that way, and he can tell you when we are safely out of town. It seemed like a decent plan, with one exception. He didn't want them leaving town. My errand shouldn't take that long, Alice continued. I know how to get to the place I'm looking for. I asked the sheriff. I'll ask one question, and then I'll be back. I won't let Wren leave the inn until she's finished her chores. Who's going to stop her, said Hawk with a smirk. Oh, for Pete's sake, said Wren hotly, tearing Hawk's hand off her mouth. If you guys promise to call me Fox and not let on I'm a girl, I swear I won't leave the inn until the chores are done, okay? I promise. Hawk considered. Wren was a troublemaker, but he'd never known her to break a promise. All right, Hawk said at last. It's a deal. But Falcon, I don't want you shooing those off at noon. I want you all here when I come back so we can talk about this. Why don't we talk about it now, said Falcon. Because I have work to do today. I don't have time to sit around all morning arguing with you. Before Falcon could lodge further protest, Hawk quickly rose from the table and made a beeline for the front door. The longer he could keep them here, the more likely they'd have to stay. Now he'd just have to figure out something to keep them busy until nightfall. Free of his argumentative siblings at last, Al walked to the northwest town wall and then turned right onto what the sheriff had called Sigenbrock Lane. There wasn't much to look at on this street except a few goat droppings and some abandoned shops and inns. He needn't have worried about being able to spot the magic shop, however. There was no mistaking it. The buildings on either side of it were dusty and cracked, but the magic shop was a deep blue of twilight sky. Its door, painted in the colors of drying blood, was solidly closed. There were no windows. Above the door, a sign with a stylized eye painted on it. Owl could swear that the eye was watching him as he approached. He made as if to knock on the door, but it swung slowly open before he could do so. Curious and more excited than he cared to admit, Al entered the dark shop. The interior was filled with the exotic smell of burning incense and lit with dozens of dancing flames enclosed in red glass globes. The effect was eerie, but Al refused to let himself become unsettled. Just because he had spent most of his life in Alpendorf didn't mean he was an ordinary village rube frightened by magic and its trappings. Sheriff Meisterson had said the shop was owned and operated by a very strange woman named Zara, but she didn't seem to be in at the moment. The shop appeared to be empty except for a lifelike ebony statue on a pedestal at the back of the room. The pedestal was located slightly off-center on a low dais along the back wall. Al approached to get a better look at the statue. About two feet high and painstakingly detailed, it appeared to represent some strange bat-winged creature of myth. Al didn't remember ever reading about this particular species. Suddenly, its eyes grew red and its wings unfurled with a leathery rustle. Al jumped back in surprise as the creature bared needle-like teeth at him. Thunder rumbled through the room, and in an enormous cloud of deep scarlet smoke, a woman appeared at the center of the dais. Her hair was the shadowed vermilion of fading embers, her eyes piercingly green under razor-fine eyebrows. But what struck Al the most was her extreme height and her finely angled bone structure, which varied in the flickering light between exquisite and grotesque. Her ears ended in graceful points, and she had six fingers on each hand. She, he concluded, the most powerful and reclusive of the fairy folk, rarely seen except in legends, and yet here one stood in front of him, looking bored and irritated as she absently stroked the leather creature that now rubbed against her like a cat. 
I am Zara, she said in a voice that rang out like ice cracking in the sudden thaw. My familiar is Damiano. Why do you enter my shop of magic? Al managed a deep bow. He, she had spoken in unaccented Silmarian, so Al did the same. I am Al, my lady, and I have traveled from a village far to the west in order to discover whether I have any talent for magic. Sara waved her hand dismissively, then turned to her familiar. I thought perhaps the stranger would have brought items to barter, she said softly to Damiano, as though Al were not in the room. But I see he is of no use to us. Humans know nothing of magic. I know there are humans who have learned magic, insisted Al, taking care to keep his tone respectful. I have always felt that I might be one of those rare individuals that pr 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 possess that potential. That was something he'd never said aloud to his brothers. They found enough to tease him about as it was. We shall see, shall we not, said Zara to her familiar. She lifted her hand from Damiano's head and traced a strange shape in the air with her finger. A trail of fire remained, like ink on a page. Let us see, she said as she completed it with a flourish, what he makes of the rune of awe. Al looked at it. The fiery shape was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. What is the rune of awe? he asked blankly. Sara seemed to draw the fire back into her fingertip, smirking with satisfaction. For the first time, she turned her attention directly to him, and she, he found himself chilled by her alien gaze. If you had the slightest trace of magical power, she said coldly, you would not need to ask. That hardly seemed fair. Are you certain, said Al? I've never had any opportunity to study. It matters not, said Zara with an impatient flick of her hand. Those mortals with the essence of magic in their souls instantly sense the power of runes. Runes are the language of magic. They encompass the entire meaning of the concept distilled in a single image. Their true meaning cannot be taught, only felt by those few with the power to recognize their nature. Could you not at least try to teach me a single spell? Al ventured. If I cannot learn, I will consider the matter settled. Zara turned scornfully back to her familiar. As you can see, she said, he is a complete fool. Please explain, said Al, struggling to keep his frustration in check. The look she turned on him made him instantly regret asking. Any spells you might learn would be made up of runes, she said scathingly. Runes which you obviously lack the means to comprehend. We of the she know different magics. But your ilk are limited to those primitive runes to manipulate the forces of mana. Al couldn't help feeling cheated. But reason told him that this woman knew much more about this than he did in such matters, and there was little point in arguing. He swallowed his disappointment as best he could. So if I had any power, said Al, I could use runes to cast spells. Would I have to draw them? Pronounce them? How does spellcasting work? Sara stared into her familiar's eerily glowing eyes. You're growing weary of this, aren't you, Damiano? She said in a silky voice. I'm sorry to bother you, Al said as humbly as he could manage, but I always seek out knowledge when I have the opportunity and I may never again be in the presence of such a powerful being. Sara turned to study him for a long, excruciating moment. Then at last she spoke. In my understanding, 
A human must learn to visualize a rune spell in its entirety, to hold the image in his mind as he concentrates upon the effect he wishes to achieve. It requires great focus and intelligence. Thank you, said Owl with a deep bow, not wishing to press his luck. I am grateful for your time. Then curiosity got the better of him. May I ask you one further question? Let us hope, she said to Damiano, that he keeps this brief. It is said that this valley holds a nexus of magical energy. Is this true? Both Zara and Damiano turned to look at him now, and the familiar's expression was just as contemptuous as his master's. It is, said Zara. That is why I remain in this god-forsaken land, to tap the power that flows through the valley. Is this nexus, nexus at a particular location? It is the exact geographical center of the valley, slightly south and east of the town. The nexus was turned into a garden over a half a century ago by the wizard Irana. At this, she turned to Damiano with an expression that might have been amusement. Did you know, she said to her familiar, that humans believe her to be the greatest spellcaster who ever lived? Damiano's opinion on this matter was made clear by his contemptuous snarl. I'd be interested to see such a place, said Al. Zara paused for a moment as if in th thought, stroking Damiano's ears. Hmm, he may be of use to me after all, then, she said. If he were to journey to that garden and bring me a fruit from Marana's tree, I might see fit to reward him for his trouble. I would be happy to assist you, Al said quickly, trying to turn Zara's attention back to him. He'd never even dreamed of seeing the Nexus firsthand. Is this garden difficult to find? Zara's eyes flickered at him briefly. You have seen, I am sure, the magical stream that encircles the town. I noticed it, yes. If you wade into the stream and follow it all the way to its source, you will be standing beneath the very tree of which I speak. It is a long walk, but you are safe as long as you wade in Nirana's stream. Nothing evil or destructive may touch those waters. The garden itself is simul similarly protected. It is for this reason that the garden is known as Irana's Peace. Al wondered why Zara just didn't go get a fruit himself, herself. Then he decided that this was one of those rare occasions that it would be better to remain ignorant. Thank you again for the knowledge you have shared with me, he said. I promise to return with the fruit, as you have asked. See that you keep that promise, said Zara coldly as she gestured for him to leave. Owl a, felt a blast of wintry air around him. Then he found himself standing completely outside the magic shop not entirely certain how he'd gotten there. Blinking painfully as his eyes readjusted to the morning sunlight, Al fought, felt a sudden staggering weight of disappointment. He lacked magical talent. There was nothing to be done about this. He would never cast spells or learn arcane secrets, despite the private dreams he had nurtured all his life. As it turned out, those dreams had been just as arrogant and childish as Hawk's fancies of becoming a great hero. But if he could visit this magical nexus before leaving, then perhaps the trip to Sigborg at least would have been worth the trouble. Besides, he thought to himself, how often does a 14-year-old peasant get a chance to do a favor for a she? That is that chapter which was chapter seven of how to be a hero by the book by Lori cole and michelle baker